Um, thanks for the introduction, Nick. As Nick mentioned, Terry's our co-founder. He's actually on vacation in Greece because that's what co-founders get to do. So um, luckily, I get to speak before you guys. Um, quick background about myself. I'm VP of Global Partnerships. So I've been with Trial Pay at quite some time. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Trial Pay, we essentially pioneered the notion of value exchange or reward-based advertising. Um, we've been in this business for over seven years, so we've actually worked with gaming developers um, at the rise of social gaming, for those of you who remember you know, Farmville or Cityville. Um, and we've really established um, a lot of partnerships um, long-term and over the past you know, year, year and a half, we've been working very closely building out our mobile platform and working with some of the biggest mobile developers today like Glue, um, Zynga, Nordius, Kabam. Um, so today what we really want to do is just you know, share with developers and folks in this industry the insights that we've learned. Um, you know, Cross-platform gaming is really becoming the norm today and so we wanted to share with you guys some of the insights and secrets we've learned of what really makes a mobile game successful. Um, so just stepping back a little bit, I mean, in terms of industry stats, I mean, I think all of you guys know using multiple devices these days is really the norm. Um, in the US alone, essentially, almost all Americans today use multiple devices sequentially throughout the day. Roughly that same percent of users own two devices in their households, whether it's television, whether it's a tablet, or whether it's a smartphone. And over half of those consumers in the US use more than one device um, while watching television. So I'm sure most of you guys are in the same boat when you're watching TV or watching Netflix. You know, most often you're also on your phone playing Candy Crush during commercial breaks or checking emails. So, you know, everyone right now is consuming content and data on multiple devices at the same time. Um, from a global perspective, um, these are some interesting stats from the recent Mary Mika report. Um, but over 22% of the global population is now using smartphones. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but when you combine users who own both a laptop or a desktop, that equals roughly the same penetration percentage of smartphone users. Um, and tablets have really been showing early stage rapid growth, um, primarily on the Android market, where I think it has about a 60% market share. Um, and quarter over quarter, Q2, we saw about a 52% growth rate in usage. So that's a pretty overwhelming statistic, even though it's still a fairly you know, small, uh, small percent penetration from the overall population. So going to mobile, I think for a lot of new developers, um, you know, how do you essentially define your cross-platform strategy when you're building out a new game? I mean, it's a fairly complicated landscape these days where it's you know, no longer just iOS and Android, because um, really when you think about the Android market, um, Google Play obviously is a dominant platform, but there's this entirely other landscape of non-Google Play you know, social networking and distribution that is available. Um, the China Android market alone is extremely complex and very fragmented. So there's you know, the Chihu 360, the Baidu, um, Amazon App Store is up and coming and we're starting to see a lot of developers you know, start to use that as a form of distribution. Um, and then on the social networking side, right? Facebook by far is the largest platform and now it's essentially a very strong platform for mobile app distribution. Um, in the Asian market, messaging platforms, you know, Line or WeChat or KakaoTalk. Um, you know, you're starting to see a lot of developers partner with these platforms for map distribution. Um, and then there's the, you know, gamers first networks like Congregate or Steam, um, where they've always kind of been both a social networking platform for gamers, as well as providing, you know, promotional opportunities and distribution for apps today. So this is essentially how we kind of see the lay of the land. Um, and hopefully throughout the rest of the talk, you know, we can explain to developers why it's important to really have a cross-platform strategy when you guys are building out your mobile apps. Um, you know, in talking with developers like Glue and King and Zynga, um, for any new indie dev, I think one of the most important things is really to first gain traction on the core mobile platforms, which essentially is Google Play and iOS. Um, in Q2 of 2014, Google Play and the App Store collectively drove over 250 million app downloads. 
So that is an orders of magnitude larger than the next mobile platform. Um, so, you know, oftentimes a lot of developers will get a little bit distracted when they're building a new app and start to focus on, you know, the China Android market or, you know, have an extremely, um, you know, global long-term vision, which is, is absolutely correct. But at the, at the very beginning, you really have to focus 100% of your efforts on gaining traction on the App Store and Google Play. Um, I think, you know, we've seen a lot of developers that have initially had an iOS first strategy, um, but really, you know, in talking with Phoenix Age, for example, which got acquired by Kabam, um, they started as an iOS first game, but when I talked to them and asked, you know, what would you have done differently, um, it really would have been, how can you have every smartphone user play your game? And the first step to that is to ensure that you can ship your new title simultaneously on iOS and Android to really maximize virality. Um, if you want your friends and your social graph to be able to play a game with you, that means you have to be on Android and iOS. Um, and Glue's a great example. I'm sure you guys all know, you know, the Kim Kardashian game that's now in the top three grossing apps um, on iOS. You know, they've essentially shipped both Android and iOS at about the same time. Dino Hunter, Deer Hunter, um, they follow the, that strategy with um, all of their latest hit titles. With that being said, you know, once a, once a new developer builds uh, an app on both iOS and Android or Google Play, um, the challenge then becomes how can you get your app discovered? Um, it's, a, it's an extremely um, saturated market where there's over two million apps. I think it's probably nearing three million at this point within the ecosystem. Um, on average, a user you know, has over 33 apps downloaded on their phone. Um, I know I'm definitely in that category. And less than a third of those users um, have even touched an app, one of those apps, in the last 30 days. Um, so the question becomes, you know, how are you going to get your, your awesome new game discovered and played by millions of users? And I know all of you guys remember the infamous Flappy Bird um, app. I mean, if you were to search Flappy Bird in the App Store today, there's literally um, dozens of similar apps. So it's hard to really differentiate and get your app noticed. So one solution that a lot of big companies are doing is what we've kind of called advertising spend. And obviously, smaller developers may not have access to these budgets, but companies like Glue, King, and Zynga, um, you know, they're essentially spending almost a quarter of their total revenue on marketing costs related to user acquisition, advertising, and whatnot. Um, you know, I'm sure most of you guys have seen firsthand that mobile CPI costs have been increasing. Um, you know, within the last three years, we've seen CPI costs rise threefold, um, which is a dramatic, especially, you know, during holiday seasons, um, CPI costs can go to eight to ten dollars per install. And so if you don't have access to these kind of endless budgets to acquire new users, you know, then another solution that we think is extremely valuable for any developer is to really leverage desktop platforms to acquire more users. Um, you know, TrialPay has actually been a, a longtime partner of Facebook where we um, exclusively power the earned economy for any reward-based transactions. And so we've really seen it be a great platform for developers to help gain loyalty and gain a bigger fan base and acquire new users. Um, I mean, I'm sure you guys know this stat, but Facebook has over 375 million users who play at least one Facebook connected game in any given month. Um, they've rolled out a ton of new tools, um, whether on the discovery side, right? So I'm sure you guys have seen this on your Facebook feed where, you know, you download an app and they want to get publishing permission for any sort of action that you do on the app that publishes to your newsfeed. Um, they've rolled out an app center where, you know, you can feature your own app trailer um, in the app center. Um, and then also, you know, Facebook Connect is a great tool where you can really generate virality and create more of a social game. Um, and then I think oftentimes this can be overlooked, but leveraging Facebook for promotional content. So building out a fan page and really building out a fan base where even if you're, you know, initially mobile first, having users go to that page and then being able to download the mobile app from that page can be extremely useful. Steam, which has over 75 million active users, um, you know, they've built out the, the green light process, which allows community users to vote for titles to be distributed in the Steam marketplace. Um, so this is a, a great platform for a lot of the mid-core, hardcore app developers to utilize to build out that community and fan base. 
um, congregate. We know these folks really well, and they've done a great job of really helping indie devs get their foot off the ground. Um, they provide distribution and promotion of their apps and oftentimes financial assistance to build out um, mobile apps. And I think you know, if you integrate their creds currency in their game, they'll oftentimes provide you with free ad impressions and promotion on their homepage. Um, and then the Amazon App Store, and you know, this is definitely um, a growing platform, and we've seen that over 75% of survey developers using Amazon say that this platform actually you know, connects them to an entirely new um, audience base or market base. Um, and in speaking with the folks over there, um, you know, the average revenue per paying user can be equal to, and in many cases, better than what uh, developers are actually generating on other other platforms. So, you know, definitely this is a, a consideration um, once you gain traction on iOS and Google Play. Um, and in addition to a lot of the promotional and distribution opportunities, right, developing on other web platforms can really have other advantages. Um, so talking to developers, you know, like King and Zynga, um, having a Facebook Canvas game can really serve as an effective test market. Um, you don't have to worry about app submission process. You essentially get instantaneous feedback from your users. So if you do A-B testing, you can get feedback instantly and then iterate that, iterate on that and then make a, you know, an update in a very short amount of time. Um, there's no dependency on mobile clients. So you don't have to worry about all the device sizes when you're building out for Android. Um, and at the end of the day, I think this is a common theme that's been reiterated through a lot of the sessions, but Players increasingly want choice of where and when they can play a game, where and when they can consume content. You know, they want it to be convenient for them. Um, so I think it's absolutely critical just making sure that your game can be played anywhere, anytime. Um, and you know, ultimately, uh, with the rising CPI costs, being able to create a social environment and generating virality is key to becoming successful. Um, so tools like Facebook Connect is, is a critical piece of the strategy. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, some of the promotional tools I think most of you guys have seen and are familiar with the Facebook um, sent to mobile functionality, um, which continues to be utilized you know, with, with top guys today. Um, you know, Glue has Deer Hunter on Facebook, Kabam uses it, Wooga and King heavily use it as well. Um, and then one of the things that we've actually built out is what we call our, our web to mobile flow. Um, so we have access to essentially almost any app on the Facebook platform where we can engage a user during gameplay and promote your mobile app. Um, so it's a very seamless flow, but a user just has to you know, easily input uh, their phone number and email, and then we can send them a download link on their phone so they can essentially download your mobile app when they're playing another Facebook game in order to earn virtual currency. Um, so this has proven to be a, a pretty effective method um, you know, that doesn't necessarily depend on Facebook advertising pricing, so it's pretty flexible, and, and developers have been pretty happy with it. Um, you know, in general, cross-platform can really be effective in engaging um, users and increasing monetization rates. So, you know, everyone knows Bejeweled Blitz is probably one of the, the earlier, you know, most successful cross-platform games. Um, and when they launched Bejeweled Blitz on mobile, you know, they saw about 20% of their users transfer over to the mobile app. Um, Facebook has, has published case studies where you know, they've seen that there's an over 2x engagement rate when a user can play both on a mobile, app, uh, mobile phone as well as on Facebook. And there's a 1.5x increase in engagement when users are playing on desktop. Um, and over 3x more revenue driven by being cross-platform. Um, King is probably the best example, as I'm sure you guys all know, of, of the most successful cross-platform game. Um, and one of the things that they've done extremely well is just provide synchronous gameplay across platform. So if you're playing Bubble Witch Saga or if you're playing Candy Crush Saga on Facebook or on your smartphone, it's actually exactly the, the same gameplay. You're on the same level. You can access your social graph if you connect with Facebook. Um, and they've seen gameplay times increase by over 50%. So the addition of you know, Candy Crush on mobile has allowed users to play what they call bite-sized sessions. So 
a quick Candy Crush game, you know, while you're on the subway or while you're on the bus to work, or you know, maybe a quick game before you head into a work meeting. Um, and they've definitely seen um, engagement double from these cross-platform players. Um, and in talking with you know a bunch of developers who heavily leverage Facebook. Facebook Connect, they see an average of about 50% of users um, that connect through Facebook. So this is a, a pretty high percentage and a fairly engaged audience where you know they're accessing you know, their social graph in your game. Um, you know, one of the consistent pieces of advice that we've gotten from the most successful developers is that it's critical to optimize for a truly mobile experience. So, this is an example of Wuga's Diamond Dash, where you know, depending on the device that you're on, whether it's an iPhone or an Android tablet, um, you know, or a PC, while they've kind of um, you know adopted the gameplay to match the device size, they do ensure that there's balanced gameplay, so there's not necessarily you know, an unfair advantage of a user who can score more points because there's more tiles, um, you know, on a larger screen. So. Um, you know, especially on Android too, you know, make sure that you're studying both the mobile platforms as well as other gaming platforms and learn the advantages of each um, and build your game to be optimized for each of those. Um, the other thing that, you know, someone like Kabam or KickSize has done really well is tailoring the gameplay to the advantages of each platform. So not just ensuring that it matches the device size, but making sure that the game, game mechanics and the, the strategy involved is really tailored to the platform. So, you know, Kabam has actually developed async um, game experiences. I think, you know, Hobbit launched on mobile first and then it was rolled out to Facebook, whereas um, you know, one of their most popular games, Kingdom of Camelot, has been Facebook and web first, and then they, they launched it on mobile. Um, and they, they made the decision to really create um, fair gameplay by ensuring that someone who played on Facebook for five years on level 200, you know, wouldn't have an unfair advantage of someone who just joined on mobile. And so they, they made the decision to make it asynchronous. Um, I think for game developers where you have decided to make it asynchronous gameplay, um, where maybe it's more of a mid-core game, you know, one um, you know opportunity is to regionalize the gameplay so that way it's a bit more fair and all the users are you know around the same level. Um, so definitely, you know, for a mid-core strategy game on desktop, um, there's a lot more opportunity to add deeper gameplay, um, more strategy, and allow more control advantages. Um, Maven Hut is an up-and-coming developer, I think they actually had a session earlier today, where they've turned Solitaire, which by definition is a single-player game, and they've made it into a real cross-platform and competitive experience. Um, so you can have real-time synchronous interaction, you can play one-on-one -on -one with someone, you can play in a tournament, um, and they've done a great job of allowing users to make it more social and share their progress, share their wins on Facebook, um, in exchange to start a new session for users who don't want to pay. Um, and you can seamlessly play from different devices um, using your same Facebook account. Um, and then the last example is Game of Thrones, where I think they're probably you know, one of the better examples today of, of how they've really made the game entirely social across all platforms and devices. Um, so one thing that they offer is a Thorium ID, which is a unified character profile, and so you can access your cross-platform friends, whether it's Facebook or whether on disruptorbeam.com or on Congregate, um, through one unified ID. Um, and they've also enhanced the gameplay so that you actually benefit in the game when you have more friends. So you can have your friends, you know, you can earn favors from them, you can form packs with friends, you can barter with friends. And so the more you have, the, the better you can advance in the game. So that's pretty much the end of the, the presentation. I mean, I think it's funny, uh, late last year, uh, we were jokingly making a prediction that the top grossing game of 2014 would be a game called Clash of the Kardashian Clan. And even though the title is different, it actually ended up becoming pretty true. Um, so I think, you know, Trial Bay, we've worked so closely with developers. It's been really interesting to see the shift of gaming from social now to mobile. And we look forward to what's going to happen in the future. And that's really, you know, up to all the developers in this room to really help um, drive that. So whether it's, you know, every user will soon be playing um, a game on Google Glass or their smart contact lens 
or you know maybe Kim Kardashian will be in a virtual reality via Oculus, or you know perhaps all games just move entirely to HTML5, um, and it becomes platform agnostic. Um, you know we're excited about what's what's going to be in the future. We know you know gaming is here to stay, but perhaps the platforms that it's on will will grow. So thanks for your time. Um, if you guys have any questions, I think we probably have time for yeah, that. We have time for a couple of questions. Or maybe I'll start the questions going. You mentioned uh, cross-platform. I didn't hear you talk about uh, TV and the big screen. What is your, uh, do you have any idea of figures for the market size for that? Um, I don't have any current stats on that. What I do know is that a lot of the, the biggest developers today are actually putting a lot more marketing efforts and their advertising costs into TV. Um, so like I'm sure you've seen Supercell and King. They're really putting a lot of focus on building out their brand awareness through television ads. I mean, I think Supercell is probably going more for the primetime television slot, um, and King is really focusing more on finding target markets to you know, show a billboard ad or show a TV ad. Um, but I do know that they've seen um, pretty effective lifts and install bases from that type of advertising. So I think increasingly, um, television will be folded into kind of the advertising budgets for gaming. Okay, that's from the advertising perspective. From actually from the hardware, the idea of using a smart TV to play games on as another platform, like a tablet, a yeah. smartphone. Um, I don't know, actually. I know the, you know, uh, Amazon Fire TV. We actually have someone from Amazon's. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but I don't have a strong perspective on where that's potentially going. Um, it's, <laughs> thank you. It's actually getting a lot easier now. Um, you'll see a lot of the TV platform systems like... Um, uh, I'm sure you guys know about uh, Chromecast and Fire TV. Uh, you'll, you can take a lot of the applications you've got working in landscape mode on tablets right now, and with a relatively little work to adjust color saturation and controller input, you can actually move those over to a light console-like TV device. Um, the place where it gets tricky, and I think the hardware is starting to catch up, is getting the memory on those devices that really supports kind of the gaming experiences that we want to build. So. Um, up until recently, a lot of those devices only had about 512 megabytes of application memory space available. Um, now, with, with, again, with Fire TV, we're starting to see two gigabytes of application memory space, so you can get Grand Theft Auto running. And like you mentioned earlier in your presentation, getting a very console light experience um, on, on your TV set for a $99 device, it's pretty good. Thanks. Questions? Wait for the mic, please. What are your thoughts on publishing to alternate app stores beyond the top two or three? You know, you, you mentioned Tencent and Baidu and some of the others and yeah. Zandex and, you know, what's the importance? Is it growing in importance? There are more than 200 stores now globally, I think. You know, how much time should a developer spend on that and how do they know where to go? Yeah, I mean, I think if you have a, you know, a brand new app where you're still trying to gain traction, then as I mentioned, iOS and Google Play are definitely areas to focus. But once you've... Exactly. Um, so that's where the cross-platform play comes in. But you know, beyond that, once you are able to really focus on secondary markets, whether it's China, Android, or alternative app markets. I mean, I know like Changyu, for example, I think they're the number two game developer in China, um, and they have an app called Mobo Genie, where ultimately you know they are looking to become an alternative to Google Play. Um, so I definitely see. I think it's kind of a, a nascent area, but um, I think people are really starting to think about it as CPI costs rise. People want alternatives. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Awesome presentation. Thanks, thank guys.